Fred Gomez Carrasco was a notorious drug cartel boss from San Antonio. After years earning millions and running from the cops, Carrasco was serving a life sentence when he decided to break out of the Walls Unit, the oldest prison in Texas. Carrasco and two henchmen took over the prison library. They held teachers and librarians captive as Carrasco bartered for his freedom. Now there's only one way that these people will see the light again, and that's for you to cooperate. The standoff set off one of the worst hostage crises in American history, the 1974 Huntsville Prison Siege. This will be our last day to live if, if, if somebody doesn't come through and help us. They're desperate men and they mean business. He's fixing to shoot me. You know, I'm fixing to die if you don't do something right now. And the rest of us in here are going to die too. These people don't have anything to lose and they're serious. And it's all on tape. Fred, the governor's on for you. The governor wants to talk to you. He can shove it. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Standoff. Dead or alive, I'm going out. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. It's no secret that human beings are social animals. Even the most introverted among us naturally seeks out the company of others to form communities and thrive based on the benefits of being a member of a collective. The powerful need to bond with others and seek out the camaraderie and protection of like-minded people is what binds us together. While the expression, finding your tribe, has only recently entered the pop culture vernacular, the underlying principle is the same. Thanks to technology, it's easier now more than ever to find communities that foster a sense of belonging. But what happens when that community starts to shift toward the more radical side of things? What happens when leaders are so charismatic they're able to influence their followers to accept delusion as reality? Leaders who would use mind control techniques to manipulate people into making life-altering decisions. That's when a community becomes a cult. Unfortunately, this is not a new phenomenon by any means. These controversial movements have been responsible for thousands of people losing their lives at the impulse of one person. Often, they claim to be religious in nature, but whose teachings are plainly fueled by paranoia and apocalyptic conspiracy theories. These groups, however, are not always easy to spot. Many former members have stated that they never realized they were in a cult until it was almost too late. Cult leaders often prey on the vulnerable and disenfranchised, people who are themselves disillusioned with the world and are looking for answers and guidance. But it's not always the marginalized that are attracted to these groups. Professionals of all walks of life are just as likely to find themselves drawn to what looks more like a networking opportunity than a recruitment by offering friendship, safety, and direction to those looking for it. Leaders gain the unwavering trust of their followers. At the same time, they're also gradually isolating them from outsiders. This is often followed by strict rules being imposed, and even stricter consequences for breaking them. Followers eventually sacrifice their free will, giving themselves over to the only person they trust to provide the answers to their problems. With headline-grabbing cults like the People's Temple, led by Jim Jones, and Heaven's Gate, the world has seen what can happen when groups are led by deranged leaders. 39 people between the ages of 24 and 72 committed the largest mass suicide ever on American soil. They all belonged to a space cult that nobody heard of at that time, Heaven's Gate. Based on what we know, this may be about people who thought it was time to shed their human containers because out there behind the hale bopp comet, there was a UFO waiting to transport them beyond this world to the kingdom of heaven. Another cult that gained notoriety was the Order of the Solar Temple. The organization's principles dated back to medieval European times, with members claiming to be disciples of a group known as the Knights Templar. This was a military order that was formed almost 1,000 years ago to protect holy sites. 
The 20th century incarnation, however, grabbed international attention, not for its defense of sacred relics, but after a series of mysterious suicides, arson, and gruesome murders across Europe and Canada. My name is Eric Crosby. Welcome to True. One guy come up and said, I, I heard you said you were Jesus. I said, uh, no, man, I ain't said nothing. He said, I'm glad. He said, I'm damn glad. I said, why? He said, I know you ain't him. I said, how do you know? He said, because I am. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> The original Knights Templar was disbanded in the 14th century, but other groups sprang up and continued to live the same values and traditions. By the 1980s, one of those was the Order of the Solar Temple. The group was established by two men, Joseph de Monbro and Luc Jure. After graduating with a medical degree in 1974, Jure quickly became disillusioned with traditional medicine. He started focusing instead on homeopathy and motivational speaking. For the next 10 years, Jure traveled around the world, spending time in Australia, Asia, Europe, and Canada, where he held speaking engagements to company executives. Joseph de Mombro was a longtime follower of occultism. In the early 1970s, he devoted himself to the New Age movement, establishing smaller organizations throughout France and Switzerland. The spiritual awareness groups were funded by their members, whose contributions helped pay for operational costs. Jure and de Mambro met when Jure was invited to lecture at one of these New Age groups in Geneva. The two men found they shared many of the same beliefs and spiritual philosophies. So, in 1984, they decided to form their own organization, headquartered in Switzerland. They bought properties in two Swiss villages to host their ceremonies and initiation rituals. The charismatic Jure used the forum to lecture about such topics as medicine and conscience. Eventually, he started to perform ceremonies himself. As members donated more money, they were invited to join another, more exclusive and secretive group the men had also created, the Order of the Solar Temple. The group's main focus was death, believing it to be nothing more than a transition into a new life on another planet. They also prophesied an apocalypse that would occur in the mid-1990s. Their motto was simple, money, sex, and joy, and as their name implied, the sun was at the center of their teachings, which, to them, meant focusing on self-awareness. As more members were recruited, in 1986, Jure and de Mambro relocated to Canada, to the province of Quebec. Once there, they established the group's new headquarters, purchasing a house and adjacent farmland about an hour north of Montreal. The organization had attracted people from a range of professional backgrounds who were highly successful in their respective fields. More importantly, people who had money. This meant that many of the members were able to relocate from Switzerland to Quebec, where they would work on the group's farm. According to Jure, moving to Quebec was essential, as he believed that when the end of the world inevitably arrived, the Canadian province would be the only place spared. He repeatedly told members that while famine and war would destroy everything, it was fire that would be the key to their successful transition. He also believed fire was essential to the purification of one's soul on the journey to complete spiritual transformation. The group was growing, but by the early 1990s, Concerns about the mismanagement of the organization's finances began surfacing. When one member, Tony Dutois, discovered that de Mambro had been misappropriating funds, he told other members, which resulted in several followers leaving, including Dutois and his wife. The rumors led to the establishment of several factions within the group, as more members demanded transparency about how their donations were being managed. While Jure was considered the alluring teacher of wisdom, de Mambro's authoritarian style had earned him the unflattering nickname, the Dictator. Adding to the group's concerns, for some reason, Jure had decided to carry a gun with an illegal silencer. 
When it was discovered and police pressed firearm charges against him, he left the country and moved back to Switzerland. By that time, it wasn't just the firearm charges that were plaguing the leaders. Authorities were also investigating Jure and DeMombro for running a money laundering operation from a rented apartment in Ottawa. An RCMP spokesman confirmed today that there is an ongoing investigation into money laundering by the Solar Temple cult. Radio Canada has reported the cult was a front used to cover up money laundering and arms smuggling. In Quebec, police are uncovering more. Legal problems aside, the leaders of the Solar Temple were facing an internal crisis, fueled by growing skepticism by its members. Jure and Dimambro felt the need to take action to address what they perceived as insubordination amongst the group. So in early October 1994, they invited several outspoken members to discuss their concerns. A meeting was set up at the Quebec property and was attended by former members Tony Dutois and his wife. The couple brought their three-month-old son, Emmanuel, wanting to show off how much he'd grown since they had left the group. They were also joined by their friend Dominique, who was still an active member, and a Swiss couple named Jerry and Colette Genoux. Unaware of the trap they had just walked into, the Dutois would not be leaving the property alive. Before the meeting, Joseph de Mambro had instructed a follower named Joel Egger to fly from Switzerland to Quebec, where he would exact punishment on the Dutois for betraying the order. It's believed that during the meeting, Egger picked up a baseball bat and beat Tony Dutois until he was barely conscious. When the assault appeared to be over, he then slashed his throat and proceeded to stab him a reported 50 times. His wife was next. She was stabbed 14 times in a seemingly ritualistic pattern. The three-month-old was stabbed with a wooden spike before his body was shoved behind a water heater in the house. Immediately after the murders, Joel Egger and their friend, Dominique, left Canada and flew back to Switzerland. Jerry and Colette Genoux stayed behind to get the house cleaned up. Intending to rid the scene of evidence, they placed a few canisters of gasoline in the middle of the floor, rigged an ignition switch, and set fire to the house. When authorities arrived at the smoldering property, they found the bodies of not just the victims, but of Jerry and Colette as well. It appeared the two had taken their own lives. In Quebec, police are uncovering more and more details about the deaths there. The more they find, the more gruesome the case becomes. Investigators know three of the dead were murdered, Nikki and Antonio Dutois and their three-month-old son. And today they reveal that the family's murder was extremely brutal. Mr. Dutois suffered multiple, uh, was stabbed at, uh, repeatedly over 50 times, and more than that, he was hit uh, repeatedly with a blunt object. The bizarre and unexplained deaths of five people at the hands of a sect was tragic enough, but it was about to get a lot worse. A former swimsuit model and naval officer create a body-positive ballet academy that ends up in a cold-blooded killing. A Brazilian supermom starts a cult-like family adopting 37 children, and then she marries one of them. Then the children team up to brutally murder the husband, who's also the stepbrother? Wondery's new weekly series, Scamfluencers, tells the unbelievable true stories behind some of the world's most infamous scams. From Wondery, co-hosts Sarah Haggy and Sachi Cool unpack what drove these scammers to deceive others and how our culture allows them to thrive. You'll hear how these charismatic and captivating people executed their schemes, conning people out of their money and sometimes their lives. Each season, Scamfluencers will immerse you in the shocking tale of fraudsters, their victims, and what happens when the facade comes crashing down. Listen to Scamfluencers on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, or you can listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? 
Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app available 24-hour roadside assistance and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you can save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. As authorities issued international arrest warrants for Jure and Demombro, police in Switzerland were about to make a horrible discovery. The same day as the fire in Quebec, one of the properties owned by the Solar Temple there had also been set on fire. When investigators were finally able to access the building, they found hidden passages concealed behind false walls. They also found that the garage had been converted into a makeshift chapel, with mirrors and drapes covering the walls. Symbolic Templar paraphernalia was everywhere, as were dead bodies. Lying on the floor were 19 people, arranged in a star-like formation, their feet pointed toward the center. Another four bodies were found, bringing the total to 23. Twenty of the victims had gunshot wounds to the head, while others had been suffocated with plastic bags. Later reports confirmed that all had ingested tranquilizers and other drugs before their deaths. The youngest victim discovered at the site was just 10 years old, 60 miles south of that location, two more properties owned by the Order of the Solar Temple had gone up in flames. Another 20 adults and five children were found dead, the youngest only four years old. Amongst the bodies, authorities found Joel Egger, who had killed the Dutois family back in Quebec, along with his accomplice, Dominique. They also found several Canadians, including the mayor of a small Quebec town, Robert Ostigy who had only been elected a year earlier, and his wife Francois were a community-minded, successful business couple. They were remembered as compassionate and giving. How they ended up among the dead bodies in Switzerland came as a shock to all those who knew them. Yet, the Ostigies reportedly donated around $300,000 to the group, and may have even been administrators. The tragedy in Switzerland has cost this town two of its most prominent citizens. Inside City Hall, councillors were shocked by the news, but don't believe the couple took their own lives. It has to be a murder. It's impossible to use. It's a suicide, especially for his wife. Because I, I know them too well. Some of the councillors had heard rumours about the couple's involvement with the Solar Temple, but they knew little more. Well, it's, it's a small town. Everybody knows everybody, so... Uh, I heard that he was he was practicing that he was in some s sect, but I didn't know I didn't know what I didn't know where I didn't know nothing. In their search of the burned-out properties in Switzerland, police found letters written by Demombro and Jure. In them. The leaders claimed that cult members died in joy and plentitude. They went on to write, Those who violated our code of honor are traitors. They suffered and will suffer the punishment they deserve forever and ever. To investigators, it was looking less like a mass suicide and more like a mass murder. That theory gained credit when a 22 caliber pistol fitted with a silencer was found in the charred debris. Days later, authorities announced they had located the two international criminals. But 46-year-old Jure and 70-year-old Demombro would not be brought in alive. The pair were among the dead found at one of the Swiss properties, along with Demombro's 12-year-old daughter. From October 3rd to October 5th, 1994, a total of 53 members of the Order of the Solar Temple had died. 
it was determined that at least 30 of the victims in Switzerland had in fact been ritualistically murdered. As the gruesome discoveries began making headlines, one former member went on record about his experience within the cult. The group offered an intense sense of belonging, a closeness. And if you pursued it, at one point, or the danger point, is where you started feeling that you are different and that you're different from the outside world. You lose touch with reality. I was too naive and I didn't want to hear anything. The little bells kept ringing. Uh, you know that little intuition, that little flash? And then you cover it up. How far it can go, I don't know. I, I'm one of the lucky ones. It didn't take long for reports to surface that the sect had been disbanded completely. But there were some who remained skeptical. Even though Jure and Dimambro were dead, how could anyone be sure that other members wouldn't continue their work? And on December 23, 1995, those concerns were realized. As police helicopters were conducting a sweep of an area in the French Alps where vehicles had been reported abandoned, they spotted something that made their skin crawl. As they scanned a wooded area not far from where the cars had parked, they saw 16 people lying out in the open. No one was moving. Overseas now, the charred bodies of 16 people, including three children, were found today in a remote region of the French Alps. They're all believed to be members of the Solar Temple cult. It's the second time in 14 months that members of the cult have perished. 53 members died in the, the mass murder suicide was believed to have taken place over a week earlier to correspond with the winter solstice. Like before, the bodies were arranged in a star configuration with their feet pointed inward. The autopsy showed, once again, many of the victims had ingested large quantities of tranquilizers and had died either from being shot or asphyxiated. Before taking their own lives, the two members who killed everyone covered the scene with accelerant and lit it on fire. Just over a year later, back in Quebec, the Kez family were about to make headlines. The family of five, including their three teenage children, were French nationals, who had moved to Canada two years earlier. They had spoken with the media following the 1994 killings, where they sympathized with the victims and dispelled rumors that the cult remained an active presence in the province. In March 1997, however, the Kez family home went up in flames. When emergency services responded, they made a grim discovery. Inside what was left of the house were the remains of five people. In the rubble, Investigators discovered a sword and ceremonial robes found at other Solar Temple sites. Unlike the five people who died inside the house, including their parents and other cult members, the teenagers had been sleeping in a separate area. All three were heavily sedated with tranquilizers. To add to the tragedy, the Kaz children didn't realize until the drugs had worn off that their parents had committed suicide. Like the previous fires in Canada and Europe, this one was also started using a timer connected to gas. For a brief period, police suspected the teenagers may have set the fire, but this was quickly ruled out. The body count now stood at 74. Authorities around the world were once again on high alert. Clearly, the Order of the Solar Temple was still active, Canada had been reporting more Swiss nationals moving to Quebec over the years, believing it to be the one place that would escape the Great Crisis they thought was still coming. But it wasn't just Canada and Europe where the group appeared to be active. In 1998, police in the Canary Islands stopped yet another mass suicide attempt. A group of around 30 people, including children, planned to end their lives at a nearby volcano. This time, authorities not only prevented another incident, but they were able to arrest one of the leaders. A 57-year-old German psychologist was later charged with organizing the attempted mass suicide. Jure and Dimambro were gone, but clearly there was still leadership within the doomsday cult. 
French police would later identify and arrest the person they believed was the order's new leader. In 2001, 58-year-old Michel Tabachnik, a high-profile Swiss orchestra conductor, was charged with participating in the 1994 mass deaths of its members, including the death of his own wife. He was later acquitted, however, would face the same charges in 2006, but again was found not guilty. In 2001, in response to the influential power these leaders had over their followers, the French government introduced new legislation. It was designed to monitor the activities of fringe groups across the country. Any religious organization found to be using mind control techniques or illegal drugs as part of their activities would be open to prosecution. Let's hope it's enough to stop further incidents perpetrated by apocalyptic cults like the Order of the Solar Temple. Now, breaking away from the world is not easy. It's difficult. It's tough. And breaking away doesn't mean that, you know, I'm, I'm going to go live in some place with this little cult and I'll, you know, spend time on weekends or at least on holidays with the family that I left because they're my family. No. It means that you leave that world behind. You even become another individual. It means that even the mind that you had as a human is aborted within the past 24 hours i have been clearly informed by my older member of how short the time is the end of this civilization is very close end of a civilization is accompanied by spading under refurbishing the planet in preparation for another civilization your only chance to survive is to leave with us. We all want love, that happily ever after feeling of finding your soulmate. What if someone not only claimed they could help you find that perfect partner, they guaranteed it? Jeff and Shalia, a young couple famous on YouTube, teach about twin flames, a deep romantic connection with your perfect ultimate partner in their videos. It's a divine love. You're designed for no one else, and they're designed for no one else. But the path to finding your twin flame isn't so simple. Those who start to doubt the group are instructed to cut ties with friends and family that are holding them back and to corner and claim their twin flame through stalking and intimidation. By the time some members are able to leave the group, they don't even recognize themselves and the harassment to rejoin makes them fear for their safety. From Wondery, Twin Flames is a podcast about what happens when the quest for love turns into a dangerous obsession. Follow Twin Flames on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Fred Gomez Carrasco was a notorious drug cartel boss from San Antonio. After years earning millions and running from the cops, Carrasco was serving a life sentence when he decided to break out of the Walls Unit, the oldest prison in Texas. Carrasco and two henchmen took over the prison library. They held teachers and librarians captive as Carrasco bartered for his freedom. Now there's only one way that these people will see the light again, and that's for you to cooperate. The standoff set off one of the worst hostage crises in American history, the 1974 Huntsville Prison Siege. This will be our last day to live if, if, if somebody doesn't come through and help us. They're desperate men and they mean business. He's fixing to shoot me. You know, I'm fixing to die if you don't do something right now. And the rest of us in here are going to die, too. These people don't have anything to lose, and they're serious. And it's all on tape. Fred, the governor's on for you. The governor wants to talk to you. He can shove it. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Standoff. Better or alive, I'm going out. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
It's the coldest hand that run down this land where the ocean lands. It's the tallest sound, the damn smallest crowd, but the hearts break loud. Far from ever feeling lost with me, I'll push you back towards the land and sea. They're going down for love, and love is free. Stick with me, and I will guarantee. You're never lost among the crowd with me. Never lost among the crowd with me. Everywhere you go, I'll be. Anywhere you go, I'll see. You're never lost among the crowd with me. True is a production of Imperative Entertainment. This episode of True was researched and written by Gemma Harris. The executive producer is Jason Hoke of Imperative Entertainment. The cover art and design were created by Jenna Sullivan. True was created and is produced by me. Have any comments or questions? Email us at podcasts at imperativeentertainment.com. As always, a huge thanks for listening. I'll be back on September 7th with all new episodes. See you then. I'll push you back towards the land and sea. They're going down for love and love is free. Stick with me and I will guarantee you're never lost among the crowd with me. Fred Gomez Carrasco was a notorious drug cartel boss from San Antonio. After years earning millions and running from the cops, Carrasco was serving a life sentence when he decided to break out of the Walls Unit, the oldest prison in Texas. Carrasco and two henchmen took over the prison library. They held teachers and librarians captive as Carrasco bartered for his freedom. Now there's only one way that these people will see the light again. And that's for you to cooperate. The standoff set off one of the worst hostage crises in American history, the 1974 Huntsville Prison Siege. This will be our last day to live if, if, if somebody doesn't come through and help us. They're desperate men and they mean business. He's fixing to shoot me. You know, I'm fixing to die if you don't do something right now. And the rest of us in there are going to die too. These people don't have anything to lose and they're serious. And it's all on tape. Fred, the governor's on for you. The governor wants to talk to you. He can shove it. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Standoff. Better alive going out. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.